Thanks for joining us. I'm Amarachi Bani. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has died. He died in prison inside the Arctic Circle. The prison service in the Yamalo Nenets district, which reported the incident, said he felt unwell after a walk on Friday. A prison said in a statement it immediately called an emergency medical team, which tried to resuscitate Mr. Navalny without success. Seen as President Vladimir Putin's most outspoken critic, Navalny was incarcerated on a 19-year jail term for offences widely considered politically motivated. Late last year, he was moved to an Arctic penal colony, considered one of the toughest jails. While the cause of death is being established, Navalny's spokesperson Kira Yamash said that they do not have any confirmation yet of his death. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says if Navalny's death is confirmed, it only underscores the weakness and rot at the heart of the system that Putin built. European Council President Charles Michel said the bloc considers the Russian regime to bear sole responsibility for Navalny's tragic death. I want to bring in now experts at the Center for Global Studies Strategy in Ukraine, Dr. Lina Sniger. Uh, she joins us from Florence, Italy. Dr. Sniger, thank you for joining us on the program. The fact that even you know, Avalnitz's lawyer is awaiting confirmation of his death, does that seem suspicious to you? The prisoner already announced that he died after feeling unwell just a few days ago or after a walk today. Mm, no suspicious for me. Uh, yeah, first of all, hi, and thank you for invitation. Yes, uh, it's not suspicious to me because uh, it was like for, uh, like many commentators say today uh, that um, it is sad, but it was uh, obvious that Naval Navalny will be, uh, would be killed in prison um, because it's just the nature of uh, Russian regime uh, to get rid of any uh, political figures that can uh, uh, create some kind of alternative or threat for the main leadership figures in Russia. So it's not like, it's not suspicious at all. It's, uh, we, we're just waiting and uh, yeah, for us, uh, for all of us, I think for everyone, it's just a matter of time when uh, the body will be given uh, to the relatives or if it would be given to the relatives, but uh, it's just a matter of time that his death would be confirmed by uh, his lawyer and his family. Yeah, and even before his death, Navalny had complained a lot about his health. He, he talked about uh, a backache at some times. He talked about respiratory problems at other times. At some times, it was his eyesight that was a problem. Uh, do you suspect that his health was uh, targeted while he was in prison? That it was inevitable that, you know, given the fact that he was a, a fierce critic of uh, President Putin? Uh, yes, uh, because... Uh First of all, he was in jail uh, already in, uh, with a weak health because he was poisoned by Novichok before. So his health was not already in a good condition. Um, before he went, he was put to prison. But uh, Russian penitentiary system is quite famous uh, due to its cruelty and uh, inhuman conditions for prisoners and uh, uh, Russian political regime is also famous due to uh, its uh, um, zero tolerance to any, uh, as I said already, political figures or uh, public figures that can produce any, uh, any alternative vision of Russian future than Russian leadership declares. So it was just, it was really obvious, and I think that Navalny also expected that uh, he will be killed, he would be killed in prison because he uh, prepared, like he, he said, uh, he, he let his testimony for his followers, like, don't give up. Uh, so he, he was prepared, he was waiting for it also.
and, and, and I remember the, the incident you're talking about, the Novichok nerve agents incident that happened in Siberia, I think in 2020. Um, I don't think his health ever, I don't think he ever fully recovered, you know, from uh, that incident. It was meant to kill him, well, thanks to, you know, the quick intervention of those around him and, of course, the German authorities uh, who offered uh, to receive him and treat him in one of the best hospitals. But, but you know, the international community has been pretty vocal against uh, President Putin's um, treatment of political opponents. Um, I'm not much sure how much they have really done, but would you blame them, uh, kind of? Because Navalny was a special case, wasn't he? He, he was uh, Putin's fiercest critic and also a political opponent. He did run for office at some time, uh, run against President Putin, uh, for the presidency, uh, now that he the the country is one less voice and opposition in the upcoming elections, do you think that um, perhaps international communities should, should take some blame for what has happened that Navalny moved from prison to prison? Well, it's not the uh, it's not the guilt of international community that uh, Russian president put, puts his opponents into prison. Uh, Yes, maybe maybe I would say that uh, uh, wrong policy to towards Russia, but not only towards Russia, but also to other authoritarian regimes, provokes uh, those authoritarian regimes to go further in their uh, temptations and in their uh, like to transform into a dictatorship and uh, like feel, feel to feel and to enjoy impunity. So this maybe is the case to blame the international community for, but it's uh, it's totally the uh, responsibility and the uh, uh, guilt of uh, a Russian political regime that uh, it breaks uh, people's life uh, lives and uh, it just kills people. Uh, for uh, according to Navalny, yes, he was. Uh, Quite an interesting phenomena in the Russian political life because he uh, was quite popular. But uh, according to sociological polls, uh, his rating uh, also was falling due to disappearance, his disappearance from the public informational sphere in Russia. Because as soon as a person, as any person is imprisoned in Russia, it just uh, he or she just disappears from uh, informational uh, sphere and people lose interest to this person. So uh, but Navalny uh, stayed quite a famous and important figure for Russian opposition in exile abroad, out of Russia. But for Russians inside Russia, uh, uh, Navalny uh, stopped to be so, uh, like, powerful and important and attractive person. Instead, uh, there is another person that, uh, uh, Boris Nadezhdin, who is uh, now uh, um, the main Putin's competitor in the future presidential elections, so-called elections, because we understand that there will be no elections, actually. Uh, so Nadezhdin, he, um, like, he substituted the uh, figure of Navalny and concentrated the attention of uh, Russian people on him recently. Uh, so this this is the fact. The, the other thing that I wanted also to uh, say is that uh, it's very interesting uh, that Navalny, though he criticized Putin and he was a popular figure and he considered himself as an opposition, he never uh, proposed uh, some uh, solid agenda of uh, a transformation of Russia. He uh, mainly was perceived uh, and declared himself as an alternative to Putin and promised some changes, but what kind of changes uh, nobody really knew. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, Russia is a very... Uh, uh, is a very strong authoritarian system. And to change it, uh, there must be made very deep and substantial uh, act, act, actions, acts. So uh, that's the thing that Navalny never proposed the alternative, the division of alternative Russia, but he was considered by the by, by Kremlin, by Russian leadership, just as a, as a dangerous alternative uh, in 
among peoples, like in people's mind. Yeah, and it is interesting that you, you should point that out because, you know, now that we really think about it, yes, um, Navalny was a critic of the Russian president. He did run for office, but it's not clear really what his agenda was, you know, what the manifestation, manifesto was, you know, for, for government. And is that, a, is that a pattern that, you know, you notice with most politicians uh, running against uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, that they have no real agenda for Russia. Um, they just criticize Putin, but they, they have no alternative to change. Yeah, they uh, because, yes, it's a pattern, actually. You're right. Because, and, but with Nadezhdin, it's different. So Navalny was declared himself as a, he was enough, brave enough to declare himself as a, a Putin's enemy like his uh, uh, real opponent. Nadezhdin Zhao is, uh, is not so bold, is not so brave to declare himself as, a Putin's, as Putin's opponent. He is just a puppet uh, figure in these elections, which is still dangerous for him. And I would say that we can expect that in future Nadezhdin will be also, can be also prosecuted just due to the fact that he dared or he agreed for this role to be a kind of puppet uh, alternative figure for uh, Russian president. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, that uh, uh, Russian activists, such as Navalny and Nadezhdin and others, uh, do not propose a, a clear agenda of Russian transformation is uh, uh, because they just are they understand that this transformation will be really will need really uh, uh, painful changes in Russia, and maybe uh, Russia will not survive this transformation as a whole state because uh, Russia is not a unilateral state. Russia is not a mono ethnic state. Russia is really different. Like it, it contains inside many peoples, many religions, um, many social groups. So Russia is very diverse and it can be uh, the, kept as a whole uh, just uh, by authoritarian or dictatorship methods. If Russia is democrat democratized, yeah. then immediately there will be raised questions from uh, subjects of Russian Federation about uh, rights, about more uh, sover like sovereign rights, about uh, uh, more responsibilities, of course, and probably about even some sovereignty and uh, or maybe autonomy. So uh, they are very; they know it. Uh, they do not speak about it, but they know it, and they are really. And they're not afraid of it, but all of them are kind of, they would like to save that big, great Russia yeah. and democratize, democratize it, but it's impossible. It's just two opposite things. I, 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 I understand, you know, what you're saying. I mean, if, if they really provided an alternative, then the problems associated with uh, democratic states would, you know, come up. People would ask for rights and so on. And it doesn't seem like anyone is really ready to answer those questions or, you know, face those challenges. Let's talk about Navalny's wife, Yulia Navalnaya. As she spoke courageously about her husband at a press conference about an hour ago, receiving a huge round of applause. Um, she still says she has no confirmation about his death. Um, she's waiting to hear, even his mother says she's also waiting to hear confirmation that Navalny really is dead. Knowing that, you know, the person with whom, you know, she she's fought side by side, because I imagine she's also, you know, a, a, a critic of President Putin and also stood by her husband um, during those times when, you, you know, he criticized the government. Do you think she will continue in his footsteps, um, even though she's in Germany, uh, can't return to, to Russia to do that, but do you think that this is... Um, you know, a, a, a course that she would like to continue um, in the near future? I think that uh, that's a good question, by the way. I was thinking about it already. Uh, I think that, uh, like, we can compare her case 
with the case of uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, which is mm -hmm. the opposition leader of uh, Belarus, uh, leader of Belarus opposition, and which uh, uh, became a very active politically uh, after imprisonment of her husband, who was the main opposition leader in Belarus during the last presidential elections and who positioned himself as an alternative figure to the president Lukashenko. So, but, but, uh, but uh, we will see if, uh, if uh, Navalny, if Yulia Navalny will become, uh, would, like, would like to become more politically active. Till now, she didn't show any signs of it, any intentions to, be, uh, to become a political figure. Maybe she will make it. But uh, there is another issue that Russian opposition in exile, political opposition, is quite diverse and is quite strong. There are already such strong figures as Kasparov, uh, Milov, and others. So, uh, and they already uh, compete for uh, the title, I would say, the title of the most important or the the the, um, the first uh, or the number one yes among Russian opposition uh, uh, leaders in exile. So uh, I doubt that uh, Yulia Navalny will win in this competition because the, if if she decides, then the competition will continue, and I doubt that she will win uh, because she doesn't have uh, any experience, political experience, but who knows, we will see. But there is a question for Russian opposition actually abroad, what they will do now. As, as soon as Navalny disappeared as a central figure of a Russian opposition movement, or what will be their actions today to uh, unite uh, those uh, Russian immigrants abroad and uh, to also to propose some alternative agenda and clear agenda for Russia for transforma transformation of Russia. You're, uh, you're, we will you're see. completely. You're, yeah, you're right, uh, Dr. Olina Snyder. Um, really need to see, you know, what the Russian opposition comes up with uh, after um, you know Navalny's death and how they oppose President Vladimir Putin. Thank you so much for joining us on the world today. Thank you. To the Russian invasion now of Ukraine, the United States is warning a key Ukrainian town of Advika could be seized by Russia. During a press briefing in Washington, White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby noted that Advika is at risk of falling into Russian control, citing Ukraine's ammunition shortages. The eastern town has been the scene of some of the fiercest fighting in recent months. Russian troops have made significant gains in Advika, threatening to encircle it, but Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has vowed to do everything to save as many Ukrainian lives as possible. A town which has been, almost been completely destroyed now is seen as a gateway to nearby Donetsk, the regional Ukrainian capital seized by Russian-backed fighters in 2014, and later illegitimately annexed by Moscow. In the meantime, the United Nations team in Ukraine has put the recovery and reconstruction costs for the country at an estimated $486 billion. It was disclosed by the spokesperson to the Secretary General, Stefan Dujaric, in the, at the UN headquarters in New York. It also touched on reports of deadly attacks across Ukraine, particularly in Kyiv, Zaporizhia, Lviv, among other cities. Our team in Ukraine, together with the World Bank, the European Commission, and the government of Ukraine, released a joint rapid damage and needs assessment. It shows that the recovery and reconstruction costs now stand at an estimated $486 billion over the next decade. That's up to $411 billion just a year ago. The assessment is a third since the war's escalation in 2022, highlighting housing, transport, commerce, industry, energy, and agriculture as the most impacted sectors. Approximately 2 million homes have been damaged or destroyed, impacting nearly 10% of all housing units in Ukraine, hindering rebuilding efforts. 
The study also indicates about 80 billion U.S. dollars in damages and loss in agriculture and $54 billion in revenue loss in the energy sector. Reports of deadly attacks are continuing. Uh, they tell us that another wave of attacks across the country overnight and this morning resulted in civilian casualties and damage to civilian infrastructure. That took place in Kiev, in Japoritsa, and in the regions of Ivanko, uh, Frankivsk, uh, and Lviv, as reported by national authorities to us. Local authorities on the front lines in Donetsk, Kharkiv, and Kherson regions also reported additional civilian casualties and damage to vital civilian infrastructure resulting from uh, continued hostilities. Humanitarian workers on the ground are providing support, including plastic sheets and other supplies. Um, we've also seen reports of missile strikes on the Russian city of Belgorod. And we reiterate one more time that attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure are prohibited under international humanitarian law and unacceptable and must stop immediately.